Well, hello, Stacy Murphy here, and I'm standing in the middle of an abundant, luscious, delicious greens garden. And guess what? It is absolutely wild out here. I tell you, wild and very chaotic. And that's what makes the magic of this garden. Uh, so Mother Nature is abundant and prosperous, and you're going to discover how this wild garden is so much fun. And what's beautiful about growing greens is that they can grow in small gardens. They can grow pretty much anywhere in any climate. The plants that you're going to see in this video, I have grown everywhere from New York to the desert to everywhere in between. And guess what? You don't need a whole lot of space. You can do this wherever you are. The only thing is that this, um, what you're about to see, this is a wild garden. So you're about to see five tips for a wildly successful greens garden. Here we go. All right, so the first thing to notice about this garden is it looks really wild, doesn't it? Um, it just looks like an explosion of greens. Just check this out. Flowering greens, herbs, flowers, lots of, lots of things that you might recognize and lots of things you might not recognize. And so one of the things when you're, when you're growing a garden, this looks like somebody just threw down a bunch of greens and just let them land where they could. But really there is an underlying structure. You can see two little posts over there at the far end. And so basically I'm gonna scroll down here and you're gonna see that there's actually some boxes. So there is some wooden boxes here. You can start to see the structure. There are a couple of wooden boxes where uh, this was where the garden was started. There are five of these boxes that are three feet by eight feet. And then basically at each end, we would put these posts so that we could trellis potentially across the whole thing if we wanted to grow something like tomatoes or cucumbers or something else. So the underlying structure, there are some boxes and there were some pathways, but guess what happened in the pathways? Magic happened in the pathways. So this garden, while it has the boxes, I think it's a good idea for a lot of people to designate some spaces where you will grow and some spaces where you will walk because you don't want to step on your soil so your soil this I'm gonna this is the one spot I can kind of see some soil your soil you want it to be nice and fluffy and light this soil right now is really dry because it's really hot out here uh, in California right now um, but you don't want to be stepping on your soil so you really do want to designate here's some growing boxes and then here's where I'm gonna walk so in this area there actually is a pathway through this zone right here. This, this zone right here is actually a pathway um, and there are some stepping stones in here. But what grew in between the wood boxes are a couple of things. This is the middle of the season, so things are exploding. There are some weeds. This is morning glory. It grows really fast. Um, I would stay ahead of that as a weed and maybe pull it out. But over here, you've got fennel fennel growing as a weed and I would keep this actually because this um, is beautiful it's delicious it's fragrant um, so we keep it in the pathways here um, and then down a couple more weeds in the pathway there is here some uh, this is sour grass and this is very delicious it's a weed the flowers you can suck the the sweetness out of them um, and they are very fun and edible so I'm not too concerned about those. There is a little bit of Bermuda grass growing back here. Um, and this Bermuda grass grows really, really fast. And so um, we try to stay ahead of the Bermuda grass, but obviously in this garden at this moment, things are a bit out of control. If you can see how out of control this garden is. Now I'm being careful where I step because one of the weeds that is growing in this garden that is actually an edible weed is right here do you guys recognize this i'm not going to touch it because this is stinging nettle and so my ankles right now are on fire from wandering around this is a medicinal green it grows once a year uh, and so we like to leave it growing in so back to the the tip that i would give for beginners who are getting started and in general for growing gardens is yes you want these boxes and you want pathways but some surprises might sprout up and to see what sprouts up and to decide what you want to keep so the reason why we keep 
this plant down here, the stinging nettle, is that it has a lot of antioxidants. It's a really wonderful wild green. Wild greens can have even more nutrients than sometimes the ones that we're cultivating in our boxes. And all of these things in here are seeds. So this will reseed itself every year and we'll make, uh, we'll make different things out of this. We'll make stinging nettle tea. We will uh, basically cook the stinging nettle and make pesto out of it. All kinds of medicinal properties out of this plant. So we allow it to keep growing the same way that we love the yellow flowers of the sour grass and we let that grow in as well. So, um, so you, when you're growing, I do recommend the boxes. So you know where you're growing and you know where you're not growing and you have a place to walk. And if you had my, right now my legs are burning from the stinging nettle. It's really, it's kind of a medicine all its own to remember how precious this all is. And then we're gonna dive into these boxes in a minute, but the first step really is then to say, okay, what, you know, tell me a little bit more about these boxes, Stacy. So when you're building up these boxes, you want to basically get wood that is not treated. These boxes happen to be from I believe they are pine. Many people pick cedar because it's a harder wood and it lasts a little bit longer, but we found that these two bys, two by meaning that it's a nice thick, thick piece of wood here. Um, this will ensure that the soil doesn't push the box outward. Um, I've done thinner, I've done one bys where it's like one inch thick and that will push the whole box outward. So this is a very, very sturdy, sturdy box and um, you can step on it, you can jump on it, it's really sturdy, and it will last you for years. Um, okay, so you build up the boxes, super simple, with a couple of, of screws holding the box together. What do you fill it with? Well, I would recommend filling it. Now, here in this box, there is a lot of compost in this box, I can see, and compost that's not fully composted. So there's eggshells that you can see in here, and there is some coffee chaff uh, this is looks like some coffee chaff that is not quite decomposed all the way. So you can see a bunch of little things in here, little eggshells in here everywhere that are not quite fully decomposed. And that's okay. They will over time. So this box you can tell is not as used as the other ones. The other boxes are filled, right, to the brim of greens. And this one is not so much. Why is that? Well, one of the things when you're laying out your boxes is that you want to make sure that you are placing them in a uh, in a location that's easy to water. This box over here is the hardest one to water. And so oftentimes there's no plants in it. So there you go. When you're laying out your site, think about three feet for your boxes, three feet wide. That's because when you're reaching from when you're sitting, squatting at the side of the box and you're reaching in to the box, you wanna make sure that you can reach the plants and work with them very easily. And in order to do that, you wanna make sure that, that it, the, the other side of the box is not too far. Otherwise, you'll be straining your back. So I like three feet, I'm pretty short, but some people can go up to four feet. If they're six feet tall, they, they have longer arms. So I lay out my boxes where they're three feet wide, three feet wide, and then basically a path that is about two feet wide, 18 inches minimum. That's like for people who can kind of sneak through very small little kids, um, but two feet is better. And then another three foot box. And then we have another path over here actually and some other things on this side. So that is the first tip is when you're growing, um, you really do want to designate. You don't have to build the box but you wanna designate where you're growing and where you're not growing so that you have a path. And keep in mind that even though you have a path doesn't mean that you can't let it just wildly grow in the path. All right, so tip number two for a wildly successful greens garden. Look at this amazing place and not just greens, but also we have some amazing herbs and flowers as well. So tip number two is diversity. Biodiversity is your friend in the garden. It means that all of the beneficial insects come to play. So when you're growing greens, you might as well go for everything. And also the other reason to go for diversity is flavor. So one of my favorite plants in the world, my species, plant is celery and this plant here is celery and you can see wow it's growing really beautifully you can see the base growing really beautifully um, you don't have to wait for the celery to grow all the way in and be thick in order to harvest this so you can cut a lot of this and it will keep growing back I 
celery is one of my spirit and spirit plants it is delicious it adds a lot of flavor to soups even to smoothies to salads it adds crunch to different dishes this is one of my favorite plants to grow in the garden and here we are in california you would think a water loving plant in the summer wouldn't do this well but guess what it loves it here um, and so you want diversity next to it um, is you can see all these flowers this is all arugula arugula flowers so there was a time when all of this was a bed of arugula down at the base and you could still eat all of these leaves I'm, I'm trying to stay out of the Sun for the sh shadow here um, you could eat all of these leaves still and they would be really spicy um, once a plant so arugula all of these plants as they grow the the typical way that plants grow you seed them they grow their greens and then eventually they will flower and so what you're seeing here is arugula flowers here and you're seeing mustard flowers those yellow ones and so once those plants start to flower they're not going to produce a whole lot more greens and so you can either wait and save some seeds which is going to take a while you have to be really patient i don't necessarily recommend it or you can just cut them down and enjoy them cook them like this they will be delicious so variety you've got celery which is crunchy and kind of almost salty like have you ever noticed how celery is a little salty and you've got this arugula and mustards which is spicy and then you've got i'm going to back up a little bit you've got all kinds of herbs and flowers so this is an african blue basil and these flowers are just floral and fragrant and they add um, a wonderful touch to salads to to smoothies uh, to anything you want these and also making pesto everything you want so a, a type of basil that that the only basil that is perennial is this one the African blue you can grow lots of different types of basil so you've got your salty greens you've got your crunchy greens you've got your spicy greens you've got your sweet greens with your basil what else do we have in here we have some staples so let's see if i can step into the garden a little bit here <laughs> and look at some staples so what are some staples okay so you're probably seeing these guys right here these are tree collards so most people when they're growing collards it's a smaller plant this is a pretty tall plant right now it is coming up to my chest and uh, look at all the amazing greens on there and there's multiple shoots so you can see the structure of a tree green a tree collared green let's see if we can get down here and look at this is that it shoots off to one side shoots off to another side so you've got multiple places to harvest from this plant and it keeps growing and growing it gets really tall so staple plants collard greens growing year-round there's also in here you'll see these you can see in comparison look how big this guy is and then look how big this kale plant is uh it is adorable oh wait i gotta come down to this one maybe nope let's go back to this one um so look how adorable this kale plant is the leaves are a little bit small and there's holes in the leaves that's okay um, that just means there's a little bit of bugs going on and the birds are basically eating those bugs so you've got this diversity of these are kind of like your sweeter greens usually they're a little bit bitter but they're technically they're a little bit sweeter compared to the mustards and in, of course if you have your staples the other staples that you want are something like you've got here some onions and this guy is actually starting to uh, flower Oops, I'm trying to get get this camera going Let's see if I can do it down here there we go so this guy is actually about to flower which is pretty cool um, so you've got these onions that you can basically harvest these are scallions technically and you can harvest these whenever you want you can pull off little spots and uh, it will keep growing so we grow scallions and just keep pulling them off also buried in here this place is wild look at how wild this is so also buried in here another kale plant over here but behind the kale look at this we got our wonderful chard which is another staple easy to grow year-round so the reason why i like all of these different staples in the garden is that you've got your kale and your collard and your swiss chard that's going to keep growing and growing and growing and then you've got your other plants like 
celery, mustards, lettuces that are gonna have to get replanted. So it's nice to have the diversity to know that there's always something to harvest somewhere and you can always make a salad. This place is incredible. Um, and I love fennel. <laughs> here it is lush in the corner over here. One of the reasons why I love fennel growing out here in California is that it actually grows to about eight feet tall and it will shade this garden in the midsummer when the when it gets really hot. And so basically it'll be a more beneficial ecosystem with this fennel in place. So you might think like, that looks like a lot of fennel. Do you really eat all of that fennel? Well, I will tell you that we do eat a lot of it, um, but at the same time, we let it grow really tall so that it shades the rest of the garden so that we don't have to water as much and, uh, and uh, the plants don't get burnt out by the sunlight. So that's a little bit about the diversity of the garden. And there are also in here, one last piece of the puzzle, are flowers, right? So one of the plants that I love growing are nasturtium. These are these big leaves here, are nasturtium. And you may have seen this plant before in the garden or at the store, and you may have seen these flowers on salads. Look at how gorgeous these guys are. So um, the nasturtiums are very spicy. They're like a pepper spicy. So they're very fun on salads as well. So I like to have, so tip number two is I like to have a wide diversity of flavors and textures so that my salads taste good, my food tastes good, um, so that if one plant isn't doing as well, then others are, and also, uh, so that in the garden, if one plant is doing better, or I'm sorry, um, So just to finish up, the reason why I love diversity in the garden, there's so many reasons. One is I love the diversity of colors and textures in the garden. I mean, isn't this incredible? Isn't this beautiful? Wouldn't you love to wake up in the morning and just look outside and see this all the time? It's wonderful. Um, and then you have the diversity of flavors for your food. And then also, depending on what is growing well and what isn't, you have a wide array of what to choose from depending on what time of year it is. And let's say uh, you had to pull all of your arugula out at one moment because it all went to seed, went to flower, you would have other things, other kind of mustard greens that are ready for you somewhere else. So I love this sort of chaotic, wild, diverse array of greens where I can wander around and look to see what looks fun to eat that day and uh, pick it and bring it to the table. So tip number three for a wildly successful greens garden like the one behind me is not easy for a lot of people. This is not for the faint of heart. Are you ready for this? The tip number three is that you need to know how to surrender and to allow nature to unfold. And this is very tricky for people who have type A personalities or people who want to plan everything. And I totally get it. I like to plan things too. And I like to know exactly when I'm going to put things in the ground and exactly when I'm going to harvest them, exactly when I'm going to eat them and what I'm going to put next in the garden to optimize everything. And I've done that too. I love those kinds of gardens too. This type of garden is a little bit different in that you are really surrendering. To, to mother nature and surrendering to your own intuition that you know you and your garden are going to have this conversation and it's going to be perfectly unfolding just for you. And so a couple of things that you need to surrender the, to the planning. The good news is that you can get started at any scale. So you can start, we started this garden with two beds on this side and then the next year we added two more and then the next year we added one more and then we kept adding these felt buckets and then we started adding all of these potted plants as well and so it naturally grew over time and it wasn't necessarily completely planned but at the same time there was a, enough structure that we could if we wanted to trellis things if we wanted to grow other things like tomatoes or cucumbers so we did a little bit of that planning but other than that we just kind of let it rip and every year it got a little bit bigger and it expanded a little bit more. And the benefit of that is that the first year that you're growing, you're learning a lot of lessons. So you get to decide what you loved growing, how it went, how long it was in the ground for, and you start to understand, okay, I planted it at this moment. 
it started to seed at this moment and then we harvested at this moment so you can kind of time things so that then the next year when your garden is a little bit bigger you have a better sense of timing so there's a benefit to starting small and experimenting and then growing with time and just allowing it to unfold and be wildly magical and then the other piece of this surrendering to the process is that anything goes out here and you know you you might be just throwing seeds randomly out here as a way to say this is what I want to grow and you throw them out there and knowing that at some point they will magically sprout because all that these seeds really need are a little bit of moisture and a little bit of love and they will sprout eventually and so in this kind of chaotic gardening you can just throw whatever seeds you want and just know that they're gonna grow in the perfect amount of time when there's enough space for them. And that's the other thing is that the plants, all they really need to thrive is good soil, of some fertilization in the way of compost, some moisture, they'll grow, they'll sprout, the seeds will sprout, and then they just need some sunlight. And so as the taller plants get harvested back, then the smaller plants can grow in behind them. And so you can throw seeds in knowing that they will come into being whenever is the right moment, whenever there is space for them to thrive. So that's the wonderful thing about a garden like this is that you can kind of watch and see what happens. And so if you are somebody who is a type A planner, this garden is a phenomenal way to let loose, to surrender, to see what happens, to let your guard down. And what it will do for you is it will stretch you into a place where you trust that the timing will be perfect, um, where you can eat, understand how much nature is here to support you and allow it to support you versus you feeling like you have to do, do, do all the time. And it also releases that pressure that you have to be perfect. Isn't it nice to know that you don't have to be perfect out here in nature? This is a great place to practice experimentation. Nature doesn't need you to be perfect. Nature just wants you to breathe because really all these plants, what do they need? They need carbon dioxide to survive. They need sunlight and carbon dioxide. All they really need from you is for you to breathe with them. How amazing is that? Can you, can you do that with them? Can you just take a couple breaths with your garden every day and throw some seeds and water it and see what happens? It's really a wonderful, magical experience when you do this kind of chaos gardening. And the one thing I will say about this is if you're going down into this territory of this wild, very wild, very chaotic gardening, is you wanna make sure that you end up with enough fertility because these greens, we're growing them year round out here, they do need compost to retain nutrients, to, that's what you want out of the plants, right? You want the plants to be nutrient rich so that you get all that beautiful food. So you want to remember to put compost in. And if you were planning a garden, you would have timed intervals where you would be putting compost back in. So in a chaotic garden like this, where every you know timing kind of goes out the window, you want to make sure that whenever you're planting something new, you're adding more compost. And that way you're ensuring that it will be, it will be long-term fertility for the garden. And also, since you're already doing something, you're already out here seeding, why not also fertilize in that same moment so that you don't forget later? So that's the one tip I would say. So that's the one tip that makes this kind of gardening really work is when you remember to fertilize as you go. And what you'll find is that there will be some really magical moments where you will think that there is more space in your garden than you realize and then something else will grow into that space. Or you'll think, oh my gosh, I don't know how it's possible for any more plants to grow in this space and something else will grow and you'll, you're, you'll be surprised how many plants you can grow in one space. You don't have to have everything in rows. You don't have to even create a pattern of circles or lines or anything. You can just literally throw seeds out here and allow the plants to do their thing. And one of the things that is helpful to know in this process is which plants will last all season and which plants you'll need to replace. And so we've talked about this already, the kale, the chard, the, the celery, the collard greens, these are things that will last all season. And then you just wanna make sure you're replenishing your lettuces and your spinaches and some of your herbs, like your parsley and your cilantro and those sorts of things. Make sure you're replenishing them often. 
Um, and so that way you'll always have this constant mix of things in your garden. So what I would recommend for a chaos garden is to ensure that you have some seeds around so that when you have a moment that you feel a little whimsical and you walk outside and you want to put some seeds down that you have them ready and available. Have things like lettuce, spinach, parsley, cilantro, uh, bok choy, other kinds of Japanese greens, mustard greens, um, anything that you know that arugula, did I mention that one? Anything that you know that you might want to have throughout the year, have those seeds on hand so you can just throw, sprinkle some seeds out there whenever you want. And the good news is, is that those particular seeds come in bags in bulk and you can get them cheaper when you buy them in bulk. So doing a chaos garden like this is oftentimes a little bit less expensive because you're, you're buying your seeds in bulk. So the number three tip for growing a successful, wildly successful chaotic garden, greens garden like this one behind me, there is really some surrendering into knowing that nature is abundant and prosperous and thriving and doesn't need a whole lot from us and to surrender into that and to allow nature to fill in the gaps so that she can surprise and delight you. All right, so the fourth tip of a wildly successful garden is knowing when to trim things and knowing when to edit. And you know, this is wild and beautiful and there's so many flowers and so many things everywhere. Um, but how do you know when to harvest? Well, my number one tip for harvesting is harvest whenever you want. These plants are so lush that no matter what you do, if they are plants like kale, collard, Swiss chard, celery, they're gonna keep on growing. And if they happen to be these arugula or mustard greens, which are flowering and you're gonna cut them back, those are not gonna grow back. So the plants that are going to continuously give you food, harvest whenever you want, and then let the other ones uh, grow in. Lettuces, spinach, arugula, Japanese greens, those are all things that basically you're gonna cut once or twice, and then basically you're going Going to let them flower or pull them out and then the other thing is as you're as you're trimming things back some things to be aware of so celery which is here um, so celery you want to be pulling like all plants pretty much if it's a stalk kind of plant um, or a lettuce or a kale or a Swiss chard you want to be pulling the outer leaves off and you want to be pulling some of these bigger ones off the oh I just pulled it off and really you can just uh, pull it down and off and it will break by itself. You don't even have to cut it if you don't want to. Um, so you want to pull off the outer leaves first because the inner leaves are where the new growth is. And so the other reason why you want to harvest is that sometimes things are not doing as well as you might hope. So this Swiss chard you'll see has some interesting things going on the leaf here. And so I would keep trimming back the Swiss chard um, and adding a little bit more fertilization just to make sure it's healthy. But these actually look like peck holes almost or like something is eating it more so than any kind of um, um, nutrient thing going on. But I would keep those outer leaves, like this leaf is no longer edible so there's no reason for it to be on the plant. So I would come out here periodically and just pull off from the base, uh, pull off those leaves that don't look so good. And you can see over here as well, you've got a couple, you've got a celery leaf right here that wants to come off that's yellowed and dried out. So that's just drawing energy away from the plant as a whole. And so it's smart to pull that off. Now, when plants are small, you may wanna cut those leaves off, but when they're this hardy, when the plants are this hardy, you can really just pull those right off with your hand and it will pull it right off at the base. Um, okay, so, and then also you'll notice over here, you've got a dried out leaf over here on this mustard green. This is a fabulous, this is called Green Wave. It's one of my favorite mustard plants. And this outer leaf is not edible and it's just, just doing nothing for the plant. It's, you know, potentially drawing 
sickness and disease to the plant because it's decaying right on the plant. So you might as well just pull that right off. It comes off really easily and clean it, clean it up a bit. So what I like to do with a wildly uh, growing garden like this is once a week, I like to go through and just make sure I pull off anything that doesn't look great because it's not going to get better. And the, what it's going to do is it's going to, it's going to focus the energy on the parts of the plant that are doing well. And so this celery plant, I just pulled off a couple of leaves. Um, now more is going to grow, be able to grow because more energy is going to be focused on what's healthy versus the part of the plant that was actually decaying and falling off. So those are opportunities for pest diseases and other things to happen. And we want to focus on our health the same way that if you were focusing on your own health, you would be focusing on eating greens and you would be focusing on doing what you know is good for you versus um, focusing on what uh, focusing on the disease that you have uh, you'd be just focused on okay I might have these symptoms of this disease, but if I eat healthy, there's a good chance that some of these symptoms might go away and I might feel better. And so focusing on the, the things that you can do to make the entire garden healthier versus worrying um, about what those things look like. So this leaf, going back to this particular leaf here, you know, you could, you could take a photograph of this and worry about what this looks like and wonder what this is and um, and then you could spend a lot of time on that or you could just pull it off and allow the plant to bounce back and it will bounce back every every single time because nature is thriving um, just make sure you're adding a little bit of fertilizer and a whole lot of love and these plants will definitely bounce back for you by the way this is still edible you know it doesn't look great it's still edible if you wanted to cook it and eat it um, you can make that decision for yourself or you can compost it knowing that your compost is going to go back into the garden. So there is no waste in nature. Pulling this off and doing something with it today just means more health for you tomorrow. So tip number three is knowing when to edit and I would edit once a week. I would go through and I would pull off anything that doesn't look super hearty and healthy. So last but definitely not least, the fifth tip for growing a wildly successful greens garden like the one behind me, the best fertilizer that you can have for this kind of garden is love. And you may have heard me say this once before, it is the number one fertilizer in any garden. So you may have seen the IKEA study where there were two plants that were identical and they were grown identically in the same soil, the same amount of water every day, uh, everything about them was identical except for one thing. One of the plants, they had the kids bully. They would whisper things to it like, you suck, you're never going to amount to anything. And the other plant, the kids would love and they would say, you're so beautiful, you're growing so well, we love you. And it should be no surprise that the plant that was bullied was much shorter than the other plant and was not thriving. It was a little bit brown on the edges and a little bit decaying and the one that was loved was thriving it was full of vitality it was extra green and so this is a great lesson for us to think about what exactly does a green thumb mean and my theory is that the only difference between somebody who's a green thumb that you would point to and say that person is a green thumb everything they do grows and somebody else is that they have just mastered the art of loving their plants and I think anybody is capable of doing that. Um, so it really is as simple as waking up in the morning and going outside and saying, you're so beautiful, I love you, to your plants. When you expect your plants to die, what kind of message does that send to them? When you expect that you're gonna be a bad caretaker and that your plants are never going to amount to anything, what kind of message do you think that sends to your plants? We are energetically connected to these plants. There, there's a resonant frequency of love and when it's in the garden, the plants can feel it. So you can do your morning routine in the garden. You can have your cup of tea, you can journal, you can do your workout, your yoga, you can just sit and breathe with your plants and just let them know how much you appreciate them. And that does a whole lot of good. And at night before you go to bed, when you're saying your blessings for the end of the day, just say a little extra appreciation for the garden. I really loved that garden or that, that flower that showed up for me today. That, that kale was really delicious today. Thank you so much. Just send a little extra blessing to the garden. It will go so far. This garden behind me, one of the reasons why I know that it thrives is that there is 
a lot of people who live in this house who love this garden and who appreciate it and that and they expect it to thrive and they expect it to grow and expand and so this garden every time I show up there is just magic out here from all of that love so tip number five super simple but never underestimate the power of your own love and appreciation and gratitude for your plants they can totally feel it well, there you have it, five tips to a wildly successful greens garden. This is a garden that is nutrient rich, full of some of the most nutrient rich greens on the planet. It's right delivered to your door. It's a couple feet outside of your kitchen, so you get the benefit of all those nutrients right on your plate. And guess what? It, you can grow any of these plants anywhere. Everything that you've seen in this video I've grown in New York, in California, in Florida, and everywhere in between. So no matter what climate you're in, these plants will thrive. And it doesn't matter how big your garden is. Isn't that nice to know? You can start small and you can always build up over time. So this is the kind of garden, the reason why it's wild and the reason why it's wildly successful is really your ability. The more you can surrender into nature and allow nature to take care of you, the more that you allow nature to show you how abundant and prosperous it can be, you'll work so little in this garden and you will reap so many rewards it will be delicious it will be a place where you play with the insects and the birds and all of the visitors it will be a gorgeous place full of flowers and beautiful colors and of course you're going to enjoy this deliciousness on your plate which means that you're you're going to feel healthy and vital and you're passing on these kinds of lessons to your family it's one of the benefits of this kind of garden is you can do this with kids it's a whole lot of fun and they're going to be really playful out here in the garden with you your inner child will love this kind of garden for more information go ahead and click the link below and you can find out more about wildly successful gardens